Our next speaker is Helen Yaffe. Helen is a senior lecturer um, in economic and social history at the University of Glasgow and visiting fellow at the Latin American and Caribbean Center at the London School of Economics. Cuba and Latin America are her specialties. And since 1995, she spent a lot of time living and researching in Cuba. She's also a founding member of Rock Against the Blockade, a British campaign for solidarity with Cuba. Um, she wrote the book, We Are Cuba, How a Revolutionary People Have Survived in a Post-Soviet World, which was published by Yale University Press in 2020. And previous to that, she wrote Che Guevara, The Economics of Revolution, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2009. Helen, we are eager to hear your words. Thank you very much. Can I start by thanking the organizers and Radhika for the invitation um, and it's a great panel of speakers. Already many important themes have been touched on and I haven't pre-prepared something um, and uh, I'm sort of not quite clear, not, not quite sure the direction I'm going to take this in because there is so much to say and it's also very difficult to know as someone who's a historian and I teach courses on, on Cuba, um, the, the level of background knowledge and Chris has given us a great history lesson. Um, I totally wanted to pick up on things that Carlos was saying because I was in Venezuela. I went into uh, Barrio 23, one of the poor neighborhoods that he was talking about uh, and saw a, a, a Cuban doctor's surgery. Um, I knew Cuban doctors who left behind their own children to go and serve on internationalist missions in Venezuela and all over the world. So um, I, I want to start by drawing this back to the title of the event, Ending US Aggression on Cuba is Key to World Peace, because um, uh, many of you here will be activists and will know this slogan, no justice, no peace. And of course, a key tenant at the core of the Cuban revolution um, is this demand for social justice social justice with sovereignty. So the anti the deep roots of anti-imperialism in the Cuban revolution should never be underestimated and nor should the importance and the pivotal role of the struggle for social justice. And this is actually, as uh, others have outlined, Cuba's great crime because um, Cuba shows that in order to achieve social justice in underdeveloped countries, and I use that term underdeveloped rather than developing very consciously, countries subjected to hundreds of years of colonialism and then imperialism, in order to uh, attain social justice, they um, have to take an anti-imperialist position. In other words, they have to um, block the exploitation and oppression that leads to the high standard of living that the uh, majority of populations enjoy in the imperialist countries. And we have to also be clear that we're not just talking about the United States. We're talking about complicity from all the imperialist countries, not just uh, in relation to Cuba, that certainly has been there. And the document, fascinating documents are there about the pressure that was applied by the White House, um, by the presidential office, in the early 1960s to insist that the British government didn't, for example, go ahead with the sale of Leyland buses and, and help to support uh, the, the to, to basically make sanctions effective on Cuba. So that's one thing. The um, I mean, let's also just, uh, you know, very briefly going back to history. What is the function of sanctions? Now, I've just written a chapter about the sanctions, the history of US sanctions on Cuba for a book called Sanctions as War. And it's actually about the sanctions against, you know, people have been talking about one third of the world has a unilateral sanctions imposed by the United States. So we have to understand these as a weapon of war, because when you deny people access to basic uh, resources that they need to live, then you are, um, you, you are targeting civilians. And that is certainly the case on Cuba. What is the function of sanctions? Now, I, I've repeated this a few times and in articles, but I think it's really important to go back to this key pivotal document written by Lester Mallory, an advisor uh, to the Office of Hemispheric Affairs or whatever it was, and when they were developing their new po uh, Cuba policy, more than a year before Fidel Castro made the announcement 
that this is a socialist revolution. More than a year before that, before the mass nationalizations, which are used as the pretext and the excuse for why the United States uh, sanctions Cuba. And what he said on the 6th of April, 1916, this secret mem memorandum is we recognize that Fidel has great popularity among the Cuban people. We recognize that the communists are gaining influence. The revolution is moving left. And we can't see any opening to develop an internal opposition. And any attempt to invade or come in from outside will be rejected. In fact, that is what happened. They did go ahead with the Bay of Pigs and the CIA training the, the uh, invaders and so on. But they said, what we need to do is essentially break the link between the population and the government. And we have to do that by using all the measures, economic measures at our disposal to create hardships and suffering. He used the word hunger and desperation. Why? In order to attain the ultimate objective overthrow of government, i.e. regime change. And now if we fast forward to the Trump era and the Biden era that we're in now, what we can see is that the 243 actions, sanctions and measures implemented by the Trump administration are a contemporary manifestation of those economic measures. But the other aspect, because this is a two track policy, create, use economic asphyxiation to create hardship, to um, create frustration, discontent, and at the same time to do everything you can to foster an internal opposition movement. And so the new social media war on Cuba, which is very important that we understand that this is an orchestrated, well-funded, well-oiled campaign. It is a strategy of the regime change programs, that this is the other aspect of the contemporary effort at the two-track policy create economic hardship and foster an internal opposition. So this is what this is about. Um, I want to say something else about the, the question of world peace. And I'm uh, aware that um, I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> so um, when, you know, Carlos was talking about the beneficiaries in Venezuela, as I said, I've seen that I've been in the barrios myself. But you know, um, in Venezuela, the Cuban doctors who poured into Venezuela at one point reaching 28,000 uh, medical staff present in Venezuela, that was the first time that many people had noticed Cuban medical internationalism. But let me tell you some incredible things. Other people noticed a little bit later with Ebola in West Africa in 2014, or perhaps earlier, when the devastating earthquake happened in, in Haiti, with a possibly estimated quarter of a million people killed in the first instance, let alone the consequences of that. But by 2014, we can say, and I'm reading from my book, which has a chapter on Cuban medical internationalism, literally millions of lives have been saved and hundreds of millions of lives improved. That is not an exaggeration. By the Ebola outbreak in 2014, Cuban medical professionals had performed 1.2 billion consultations overseas, attended 2.2 million births and performed over 8 million surgeries. More than 4,000 Cuban medical professionals had um, over half of them doctors were already working in 32 African countries at that time. And some 76,000 Cuban medical personnel had already worked in 39 African countries since the 1960s. So when we talk about peace and the need to, to stop US aggression on Cuba in order to attain peace, we are also talking about the Cuban revolution and what it has done for its investments in, in um, education and healthcare for the rest of the world. The uh, internationalism of the Cuban revolution, which has seen millions of beneficiaries around the world. And even when COVID-19 happened, the rest of the world, I remember, I'm sure you do, the images from Lombardy in Italy, when it was the 
epicenter of the pandemic and they were saying where is the european union where is where is our help everyone ran away but the cubans ran to the epicenter of the pandemic at that point just as they had done in west africa and just as they had done in haiti and are once again doing again with the new scenario in haiti so i'll stop there i hope in the discussion we can focus a little bit on what we can do to combat if not stop us aggression against cuba